It's the My Michelle Live podcast. My Michelle Live, Psy Tech Talk, taking the God story to a geeky place. Here's Michelle. Hey, thanks for hanging out with me. Kids, welcome to Psy Tech class today because we're going to make it really simple. I'm going to tell you, it's been pretty obvious that we've been messing up science a lot lately. And I'll talk about how and what those implications are today. But today, we're going to show you how even something as simple as Mr. Potato Head reveals a deep truth in science that has implications for the rest of your life and beyond. Seriously. So hang out with us today. My partner in this, a first timer to the show, and I've already had fun with them and we just turned on the mic, Calvin Smith. Now, Calvin is a host of Creation Basics. It's a five minute show that is designed to make God's creation part of your everyday conversation. I like that. He is also the executive director director and a speaker for Answers in Genesis, oh, Canada style. Calvin, thanks for joining me today. Great to be here. All right. I'm going to set the stage. Um, let's just take it back to 1900. Since that time, it's been a federal offense to take, possess, transport, sell, import, export eagle's eggs, right? Why? Because for some weird reason, we think inside those eagle's eggs, there's an eagle, a baby eagle. But now, Go right, right, weird. But now we're so scientifically advanced that we have no idea what's inside a human embryo, inside the womb. That, that, that couldn't possibly be a human. And that's just one example. We used to believe that DNA, for example, can dictate differences in male and female. And there's even differences in men's brains and, and body structure, larger hearts, lungs, more muscle mass. But now in our scientific advancement, we think sex is subjective. Oh, but wait, let me give one more, one more. Scientific con confusion is at an epic level. So when it comes to intelligent design, for example, while there's no evidence outside of microevolution in, and no evidence of interspecies change, we still tout evolutionary biology. So this is what ways, it, Calvin, that I think that we've gotten things messed up, and that's just a short list. So we're going to make it simple. Mr. Potato Head and Mr. Calvin are going to give us a little lesson that might be able to set things on track. And I'm really glad that we're doing this today, but why Mr. Potato? I'm always trying to basically tell the same uh, kind of information and make it accessible at all different ages. So when I, I've got uh, 12 grandkids now, 10 that I can see, two that are on the way. And I'm often having conversations with them, trying to, you know, tell them biblical truths and stuff like that. So I've thought of that analogy of Mr. Potato Head coming with certain parts inside him. There's variation of those parts. And the fact is that you can switch them around and swap them around as many times as you want, but you'll never get a Mr. Potato to develop any kind of parts that didn't come with him. And that's a very simplistic concept, but really that was the, uh, the point in the blog article, I think, that you read. Yeah, you that, you, you uh, tell grandkids. Conversation here. But to speak to your earlier examples, okay. what you were really talking about there was not science in the sense that most people understand it, which is observational, repeatable, observable yes. science, empirical science, so to say, where you could set up an experiment in a lab. You can do it over and over again. You can repeat the results. You can invite your friend to come. You can do that experiment on any place on the planet and get the same results. That's typically the way we think about science, right? So if you want to test what water boils at sea level on the planet, it's pretty simple. Get a pot of water, stick it on the stove, stick the burner on and, and drop your you know thermometer in. You're going to get 100 degrees Celsius every time. That's repeatable, observable operational science. What you're talking about is where people take ideological or political or they've got some kind of uh, viewpoint and they impose that ideology on science to somehow justify their their beliefs or their morality or their ethical stance, et cetera. And so science gets often gets abused in that way. And we've been pointing that out with Answers to Genesis for many years, that the story of evolution 
has basically hijacked science with this veneer of scientific credibility and then professed that this is absolute fact and truth and this is what we should be teaching in public schools. And they've been doing it now for many generations. When people get this idea that, oh, they took religion out of school. No, they didn't. They just swapped in a humanistic religion in there. Boom. And that's why just simple examples like my Mr. Potato Head example catches people's attentions and so on. Yeah, the whole point of the article was this. Uh, natural selection, genetic mutation, these are things that we can observe in science. Selection is a selection process. You're only selecting from what's already there, which is what I was getting at with my Mr. Potato Head example. And then mutations, this is why they now teach neo-Darwinian evolution. They don't teach Darwinian evolution because it wasn't too long after Darwin proposed this idea that somebody put up their hand and said, wait a sec, a selection process only selects from what's there. What's supposedly creating all this new genetic information for forms, functions, and features that never before existed? <clears throat> If the story of evolution is true and you were going to turn a lizard-like creature into a bird, let's say, you would have to somehow write out reams of brand new information for genetic coding for wings and feathers and preen glands and different lung systems and all these things that a, a lizard doesn't have and a bird does have. So what's creating all this? They now say genetic mutation doesn't. But mutations are just spelling errors in DNA. And spelling mistakes in DNA is not going to create brand new genetic information for these forms functions and features that never existed before it just breaks stuff that's all it does so i think when you take this story of evolution which often has a whole bunch of sophisticated verbiage and pretty pictures and diagrams and all these things and you just bring it to a very simple level most people would say yeah that doesn't make any sense at all when we talk about genetic mutation, natural selection, they seem to be, according to what you just said, at odds. And we don't often talk about that. What I mean is that when you have a genetic mutation, you you just said, yeah, it pretty much breaks stuff. It, right. it doesn't make things better. The idea of natural selection is a, a longer beak so that I can get it so that a bird can reach into the crevices of a rock and they're more likely to eat that way and get the bugs they need. So that mutation, so to speak, uh, aids in natural selection. But when you talk about a genetic mutation and you say it breaks stuff it doesn't make us fitter so how that's why i say it's at odds with natural selection because natural selection makes you fitter so how does that work you see it's in the again the verbiage so i'm not saying that there's not mutations that don't have a positive survival benefit we've seen that for example for example if you get a a little island or let's say you get the water levels lower somewhere in in a specific situation so all of a sudden you've got an island it was once attached to the mainland but the water's levels drop and so now you've just got this little island or the water levels rise and now it's no longer connected so let's say you've got a population of beetles on that island okay and they get a mutation that stunts their wings so they don't got they don't have wings so now you've got a population with some of them don't have wings, some of them do have wings, and they're on an island. The wind blows very hard, and all the winged beetles that are flying around get blown out to sea and they die. That's a survival benefit then. That, that mutation that stunted the wings of this beetle population is now a survival benefit. Hey, this is great. They can, they've adapted to their environment better. This is the way the evolutionists would say it. See this positive mutation? wings now it doesn't have wings that's not evolution evolution is all about getting new forms functions and features but do you see how that mutation benefited that creature in that environment now here's the problem when the water levels drop again and all of a sudden that island gets connected to the mainland and all the predators can come back and they start hunting the beetles the ones that can't fly away they get eaten and they die and now it's a it's a disadvantage so what the creationist is saying is watch carefully the way these ideas are expressed. Sure, mutations could have a benefit in a certain situation, but it's no benefit to the story of evolution, which requires by definition that if you started with some single-celled organism and evolved it into something as sophisticated as us today, you've got to add reams of brand new positive genetic information 
for all sorts of characteristics that never before existed prior to that somehow coming into existence. So with our beetle example, we go back to Mr. Potato Head. All you're doing is plucking off the wings, essentially, uh, that already came with the toy. When you look at genetic mutation, when you're looking at change, now that we know about DNA and the programming of DNA, the old idea of evolution, Darwinian evolution, is just so archaic because it would have to be in the program. When I have a computer, if I, when I needed to set up my computer for broadcasting, my computer didn't come with all of the idiosyncrasies and all of the programs needed to do the very broadcast we're doing today. I had to add them. It wasn't already in the programming. And it's not already in the programming. And we can see that in, in DNA. So why are we still having this conversation uh, in, in the grander sense, Calvin? Yeah, it, it is amazing. One of the blog articles I did uh, last year was just talking about the a, a, a challenge and every maybe your listeners can uh, can make themselves 10 million dollars because the voices of oxford so this is a group from oxford university some brilliant scientists are offering a 10 million dollar prize to anyone who can come up with an experiment demonstrating how a code can originate naturalistically now Ooh. they are specifically talking about the genetic code in living things and it's this mystery to them as to how on earth a code could emerge through naturalistic properties because in our human experience every coded language system we've ever seen has always been demonstrated to come an intelligent mind again to keep it quite simplistically if i'm walking down the beach and i see in the, in the sand somebody has scrawled johnny loves susie in the sand it wouldn't be logical or rational for me to sit there and go hey look at what the wind and the tide brought in that would be irrational based on what we know about sand and coded language systems. If I uh, take a piece of chalk and I write on the board, hi, my name's Cal, where did the information come from? If I wipe off all the chalk, is there any information in chalk? No, the information came from a hopefully intelligent mind that arranged matter in a certain order according to a pre-existed agreement that humans have made, basically saying that this is gonna <laughs> indicate a coded language system in English. But that's all due to an intelligent mind. So when we look at DNA, the most sophisticated coded language system we've ever seen, why would we not then give glory to God and say it must have come from the most sophisticated mind we can imagine, the creator God of the Bible. And so this group in Oxford is literally offering $10 million. And <laughs> it's a fascinating read if you read their, their requirements, because you can't tinker with the system, so to speak. You can't impose a coded language system on it. You just have to discover it naturally. Scientists have been doing that for years. We, we just examine the creation. We, we take a look at it. How exactly did these Oxford scientists expect us to find this? If I don't impose a code on the matter, then what am I supposed to do? Just take a magnifying glass and run around the creation and look for it to, to mightily happen? It's ridiculous. It's actually preposterous. And they indicate in their instructions that you can't basically say God did it. Well, if you remove God from the equation, okay, so you've a priori decided that God's not there. That's actually the way evolutionists are operating in our school systems. You just exclude God. You say evolution is the only way we can explain it. And then you run around banging your head, trying to figure out how coded language systems come into being. It's exactly what the scripture says, forever learning and never coming to an understanding of the truth because you remove God from the equation. And the another thing that I find preposterous and very hard to wrap my head around when, when trying to challenge a biblical worldview scientifically is that if for some, we'll say for argument's sake, that there could possibly be just happenstance of life coming from non-life <laughs> and evolving into something it wasn't, okay, the fact that we have such diversity on our planet, it wouldn't have just happened to be an oops <gasps> once. It would have hap had to have happened hundreds, thousands of times. There's not enough eons to create or to happen the amount of diversity in 
bugs and birds and mammals. It's astounding. In plant life, we could we try to segment one area of science and say it could have happened really, and it could have happened here and here. Oh, and there and there, and it, it becomes even more preposterous. Calvin, you're right because the preponderance of genetic mutations that would have needed to occur to account for all the diversity of life with no mind behind it is absolutely astonishing. Now, scientists have been trying to observe mutations, create useful genetic information, de novo, brand new information that never existed before for many years now, all over the planet, very sophisticated technology. They do not have one you know, example that they can tout and say, look, we can see that brand new genetic information has evolved that wasn't there before. They don't have one example, but let's say they were able to produce one. To your point, in order for evolution to have occurred, it would have had to literally happen billions and billions of times in order to account for all of the diversity. And though they don't even have one example. So and, really and what what's would happened count? is naturalism has been introduced into the West, Western school systems and taught in exclusion to all other explanations. Of, and it's just got this credibility built up around it that really it just, it's, it, it, it shouldn't be have been afforded at all. And I point that out in my, my article, how if your theory, scientific theory, does not have observational evidence to back it up, it's a hypothesis at best. There you and go. And blind faith at worst. Because obviously Christianity is has been taken to task all across the world as being some kind of check your brains at the door, go to church, and then go back into the real world, and you don't know about science, and you don't accept science and all that stuff. I love science. I'm not a scientist. I've worked with many scientists over the years. But, but yeah, this whole concept of blind faith. Number one, if you think that non-living chemicals have, have turned into some kind of life form in the past, you don't have an observable example of that. We right. have only ever observed life coming from life. So if you believe that in the past life came from non-life, you believe it on faith, not science. Indeed. Not observable science. So it's literally a miracle that the atheists and evolutionists are believing in. And we're saying, yeah, I believe in miracles too. I know Jesus came back from the dead, and I know that's a supernatural occurrence. But I know that all of the things that happen in, in Scripture that are supernatural occurred because it's the word of God. And actually, if you don't start with the word of God and you don't start with God as your main uh, concept, you can't even explain anything uh, that you're experiencing in my, uh, my estimation. And so what you have is a, as you mentioned, a blind faith. There's no way to account for the fact that we can't observe life coming from non-life now how would that have just all of a sudden stopped some time ago we there are so many things and there's a beautiful consistency throughout everything in the universe there really is you see a consistency it, it a, a logical flow it, it, it there is not a sign of chaos but organization and you'll see that in in science, you'll see that in the microbiology, you'll see that in the cosmos, the way things interact. And the beauty of it is that there's also a, as you alluded to, a beautiful consistency with a biblical worldview. It just flows together where like you don't- science, it's, science itself is founded on the concept of uniformity. So uniformity means that the creation is going to operate the same yesterday as it did today as it's going to go tomorrow. Because otherwise, why would you set up an experiment? If I live in a universe which is in a constant chain, in a state of flux and change and evolutionary uh, changes and ad adaptation, why would I expect the experiment that I set up today to be the same tomorrow if the laws of the universe might change? So a biblical worldview is foundational to even conducting science. I set up the experiment because God has created laws of nature and fundamental laws throughout the universe. I'm going to get the same result. That is based on a biblical worldview. It's not okay. based on an evolutionary worldview where things are constantly in flux, etc. Okay. Okay, so let's look for a moment then at the implications in the last minute and a half we have here. The implications of a consistent worldview, the implications of a biblical worldview, 
is life. But when you when you dabble to the exclusion of all other ideas with this idea that life comes from non-life, that really means that we have no value. And a rat is a pig, is a dog, is a boy, so to speak. When, when you have that mindset, it's easy to say we don't care if we kill something in the womb. It's easy to demonize other people on social media and to cause great division because we can't recognize that each of us is made in the image and likeness of God. We see people who have a complete disregard for life and can walk into a a school killing innocent children. We see that as a byproduct of the mindset and the uh, worldview that we have adhered to so closely. And that's why I said that even Mr. Potato Head can give us a little insight into a truth that has implications in our real world and right. in the world so people, to come. And I want to give you the final people word. People are getting consistent with what they're being taught in school. What they're being taught in school is that you are an evolved animal. We're just the most evolved animal, let's say. But think about it. When no, I they're saying you're sheep, goo. You're essentially goo. You're, you're, it's right. not but, even but an I'm animal. I'm sophisticated <laughs> goo and I can think. But when I look at a, a great white shark take out a seal, I don't think of it as a serial killer. When I look at a wolf take down a rabbit, I don't think of it as a, oh, that's evil. That's quote unquote nature. But if I'm just an evolved animal and I go murder somebody, what's the difference? So people are starting to become consistent. Hey, it's just survival of the fittest. If I kill you and take your stuff, now I'm better able to survive. This is what people aren't understanding is people are becoming consistent with the worldview that's being taught in our state run school systems, which is really atheism. I can explain everything without God. Cosmological evolution, geological evolution, chemical evolution, biological evolution, human evolution, that's it. No God required. Here's your little package. Take that and go live your life. And when you get that consistently, you will see what we see in our society today is people are not treating each other like they're created in the image of God. They're treating each other, well, you got some leftover bacteria, might as well. This has been an exciting conversation. It really has implications in our daily life and that gives you food for thought as you're watching, listening, or viewing. I encourage you, uh, share this, like it, make comments. The more that you do, the more it perpetuates the God story that we share on every single episode. If you want a little more insight, I will put a link, uh, likely wherever you're listening or viewing or, or reading, but if not, go to mymichellelive.com and you can get a link to the article that Calvin wrote. Calvin, our first time interacting, and this has been a blast, so I hope you'll join us again because it's been a lot of fun Absolutely. for me. Absolutely. All right, thank hey, thank you for watching and listening and being part of the fun. More SciTech Talk at MyMichelleLive.com.